Hello, Hardcore Finance Podcast listeners, and welcome to another episode of Hardcore Finance Podcast with Alex and Shimon. Shimon couldn't be here today, unfortunately, but um, we have a treat of a guest. Uh, it's our old uh, former professor from Kellogg, and actually uh, the current professor at the Wharton School, Professor God Alone. And uh, God Alone is a very special treat for us because he's the Jeffrey Keswin Professor of, of, of Operations and Information and Decision Making Sciences. And he's actually the director of the management technology program at UPenn. Formerly, before that, he was a Kellogg and he received his PhD in management sciences for Columbia and holds a bachelor's and a master's degree from the Israeli Institute of Technology. Writes for many publications, is an award winning educator, um, and just, you know, outside of God's professional bio, Professor Alone's professional bio, I'll just put this into context for our, our viewers and listeners. In business school, you have a bidding system and you kind of bid for classes. <laughs> I'm going to put you on a spot a little bit here. And, uh, you, you know, some professors and classes go for a dozen points, a couple hundred points. A professor alone's classes, would oh, the demand was so high and so out the door with so many waiting lists, both at Kellogg and at Wharton, that his classes would go for literally your entire point allocation for the year, just for one class. And then you kind of got, you know, the, the pick of the litter for everything else, I would say. But... Uh, <laughs> But uh, uh, Professor, so lucky to have you. Welcome, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Good, Alex. Great to be here, and 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 still great to be here again after you know having you in class. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you paid I, the I mean, price for that. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I definitely <laughs> paid a price uh, for for taking your class. So one of the things you know I like to jump off and talk about is I love to hear a little bit about how, you know how you got into teaching you know why operations and decision making, and I know that. You, you know, you specialize, especially most recently um, around the gig economy. So just, you know, tell us your story. Why did you leave Kellogg for Wharton? Uh, and then, uh, and why, why the gig economy? Why is that such a big of an interest to you? Yeah, maybe starting a little bit background uh, before that. My, my background is in technology. I was a self-taught software developer, I worked for several Israeli startups, did my PhD at Columbia. Um, and, and, so if like throughout that entire process, uh, to some extent, there is always one or two professors that are, are, are sort of like motivating you and, and sort of like are, are in many ways are playing a role model. For me, I think it was a few people at, at the Technion that really what was interesting for me was the fact that on one side, they really looked at tangible processes and tangible problems so call centers inventory supply chains where there is really it's not just you know the i know that you call it hardcore finance it's not just like the lofty ideas of finance uh, but at the same time using very very rigorous math mathematics to try to understand that so stochastic processes optimization game theory and so the combination between being very, very applied but while also taking a very rigorous mathematical analytical approach, I think operations are exactly in the sweet spot between these two. That in many ways what brought me to the gig economy as well. Um, so I started working on that a little bit um, after I moved to Wharton um, and I was introduced to people from one of the ride sharing firms. And, and just usually I ask people, what are really, what's top of mind for you? What, what are really the main issues that you struggle with? Uh, and it was, I've been working already for a while on issues related to services. How do you staff call centers? How do you predict how customers behave? But it was very clear that in most of these situations, um, the firms I looked at, when they decide on staffing, they manage their own employees. When I came and spoke with the gig economy people, they basically want, they said, well, you know, the customer side, We'll let the marketing people solve. But the issue that we really face is that we don't have staff. We don't have, like when we need, when we promise a certain service level and we want to say five minutes waiting time, we need to target a certain number of people to show up. But we actually don't tell them where to show up. We don't tell them when to show up. When in fact, at the times where we need them, they also are being drawn in by DoorDash, by Uber, by many other choices. So on the one side, we said, well, it, it's great because we are very asset light, which is why we see these valuations to be so great. But at the same time, we have to use levers that are significantly more complex. And if you can help us with that, we can do that. And that's in many ways, I think it was the starting point for me just to start to understand the complexity of that. 
Because if I'll say a word about the complexity, there is complexity on both sides, right? I mean, I think in many ways, the promise of the gig economy is the ability to match supply and demand, right? Operations, if I have to summarize operation in one word, it will be the goal is to match supply and demand. The difficulty is that the demand now is, of course, drawn by many, many other different platforms, but also the supply is not one you control. And so this is really the, the entry point into understanding uh, the gig economy. Yeah, you had an interesting talk. I think it was in 2019 in London uh, as part of, uh, I guess, your Wharton and Traveling Series or um, uh, one of your talks. And you talked about Via, the car sharing platform and Deliveroo. And one of the things you talked about is the, the premise of your talk was how to incentivize gig economy workers. But you've mentioned there's a couple of things and I'd love to dig in. But you mentioned the complexity here being, you know, if you're an Uber driver, you're also a Lyft driver and you can also be doing other things. So how do you incentivize these freelance workers, right? These gig economy workers when they are actually employed by many companies, sometimes your own peers, and you need them to come and go. So the surge pricing, I don't want to steal your thunder, but there's the kind of three main points to take away from that. Let's, let's bring our listeners up to speed because I think it's very interesting. Yeah, so let me actually start from actually taking a step back and, and going exactly to your, the point you made, which is for most of us, I'm sure most of the people listening to this podcast, they make employment decision maybe once a year. If you're in academia, once in seven years, <laughs> uh, right? And when you look at the gig economy, they make three decisions almost every 15 minutes. 15 minutes. They make a decision which platform because most of them do what we call multi-homing. So they work both for Uber and for Lyft, both for DoorDash and for Uber Eats, right? You, many times you go into a car and you see that they have multiple uh, uh, apps open. Then they make a decision of when to work because they might have their schedule. I'm sure you've been on an Uber when they said, I, I do only nights or I do only morning and then I come back in the evening. And then they make a decision of how long to work. And they make that every essentially 15 to 50 minutes. So the key question that we had in mind to begin with was, you know, there is a lot of literature in labor economics. They've been studying for many years, but this entire theory was based on employment, unemployment, the fact that people make decisions, search for a job for a while, and then start working. Here, we have a whole new economy by a, whole, a very different cadence of decision-making. And that actually exactly what brought us to understand what's the role of wages and what's the role of time. And let me just give you a little bit of background on that. Mm -hmm. One of the surprising parts, I mean, I'm sure the listeners to that podcast are asking themselves, why is that even a question? I pay people more, I expect more of them to show up. Yet, one of the things that was observed already from, in fact, the 90s, is if you look at cab drivers in New York, when the city wanted to have more of them work during rush hour and they pay them more, the drivers actually worked less. Why? Because none of these drivers, their dream is to be a cab driver, right? If you actually, they have a target, and if they earn that target earlier, they will actually go and do other things, watch soccer, play baseball, spend time with their kids. And so the question was, what's going to be the role of wages? To what extent people are, have like an, a reference point, like a target? And to what extent they have a target in terms of time? And that's to some extent really the central piece of, of our, our, our project. Uh, because what we do is that we, we observe um, throughout one year around 8,000 drivers, but we observe each and every decision, each and every offer that they made. One of the interesting things about the gig economy, it's a very data-driven uh, place, right? Most, most of the people, again, listening to this podcast, their employer probably has maybe 100 different wage levels. Maybe... 200 if they have a few thousand employees. Here you have 8,000 employees with around 1,000 different base salaries. And each one of these base salaries are continuously going up and down based on whether they give them a promotion or no promotion, trying to, pro to bring them to work or trying to actually make sure they're not coming to work when they're not needed. Imagine the level of complexity and then you need to, to what you're trying to generate is some level of baseline of just understanding how do people behave. So that's really, and, and I'm happy to, to get into that a, a, in a second, but how do, that was really the question. Do yeah. people respond to wages? Do people respond to what happened until now? Do they have income targeting? Do they have time targeting? 
Yeah, so so there's an, an interesting point there, and I'll spoil a little bit of your, uh, of your thesis that people do respond to wages because there's I think there's an uber more interesting point which leads to a whole bigger uh, topic that I want to lead you down. But I, I think to me what's really interesting about the gig economy, uh, two, well, two things on a macro level that the corporations are shifting. And, uh, a lot of times you can shift your labor structure, right? Again, from a fixed workforce to a... Uh, fluid and um, fluid workforce. And what that does is it, of course, like you said, you're attempting to match supply and demand. And one of the things that we talked a lot about in your class that I'm sure you talk about now is what happens in peaks. And what's interesting to me about, about here is two points. One point you mentioned that once they hit an internal, once, you know, every person has their own, you know, demand curve, if you will, of what they, you know, or, or I guess their own supply curve, of what they're willing to work. When they hit a peak, they're done, right? The interesting part, or the way they hit the target, the interesting part is when you have, when you're working for multiple peers, right, at the same time, uh, and the demand surges, not like, it, it, so if you're working for Instacart and Uber, for example, you can have an Uber surge, which is different than the Instacart surge. But if you're working for Uber and Lyft, you're pretty much going to hit the same surge at the exact same time. And both Uber and Lyft are going to want to incentivize their workers, right, to perform at the exact same time, right. coupled with the fact that the worker might have reached his or her peak or his or her target, right? right. So where I want to go here is, and, and where I want to lead you is to a, ma a macro theme of Corona, because we've hit these peaks during, especially during the early stages of COVID when they hit, right? How do you think about or how the companies maximize or match the supply and demand when you have a peak, when you, the workers, because of the peak and surge prices, are probably are hitting their targets and you're getting a peak across the board with all the peers that they're working uh, in as well. And you just have to service, you know, the consumer. So how, how, do, you, how do you balance all that? Yeah, I, I think that actually led me to probably the, so if, if I'll summarize very quickly what you said, right? I mean, like the, the more you pay people, the more likely they're going to come. But actually, as they get closer and closer to their target, the less likely they're for them to continue. But here, actually, we find another phenomena that was not observed in the literature before that, and, and I think is actually quite crucial as to be able to understand what some of them do. And one of the most consistent phenomena we saw is something that we call not time targeting, but actually inertia. Let me spend a minute and just explaining what I mean by that. So what we saw is consistently the more the longer people worked time wise for a specific firm the long the more likely they are to continue and if they continue the longer they are to continue to drive now professor sorry really is that micro or macro so is it within the day or macro uh, longer both. tenure okay. both both within the day and across days now, why that's important? Because this is exactly to some extent, if you look at, I think the firm that understands that, in my opinion, the, the best is Uber. Because basically, what does that mean? You want to make sure that your driver continuously drive for you. One of the nice things that Uber does when I say nice, I mean, I, I, it's not, I, I, whether it's nice or not, that's a different uh, question, but what do they do that demonstrate this level of understanding is many of the drivers get their next ride before they drop the previous one. To lock them in and to keep, exactly. keep the inertia going. Exactly. Because you want them, the, there is very strong, I mean, this inertia is stronger than the wage and stronger than the income targeting. In fact, that is the strongest phenomena across days and within days. And so what we are basically saying is, while it's true that most gig economy drivers are looking for flexibility. If you ask them what, one of the one th what, why do they use the gig economy as a way to make money, uh, most of them will say, of course, it's supplement their salary, but the big part of that is the flexibility to decide when to work, how long to work. Even though they want flexibility, a lot of what you see is an attempt to generate consistency. And, and, and so I think if firms that will understand that and will understand that you can actually create a situation where people are going to be consistently for you. Given the tools you have, I think that's going to actually make things much, much easier for the drivers themselves. And, and, and I should say from the beginning, monetary things work, but actually they're secondary to this inertia.
So how do you how do you build this in our show? Let's take it more macro. So yep. very real scenario, COVID hits, right? And so you need Instacart to go to the store and you know bring bring groceries back, and you need Amazon to um, to deliver packages, and and you know there's there are many obviously implications of COVID, but you know there's maybe two points here. One, how do you scale up quickly? right? When yeah. everyone's trying to scale up, when you don't have inertia, everyone's starting essentially from zero, more or less based on, I think the, the magnitude of the phenomenon, right? So, and so how do you build an inertia when you're starting from zero? Is it a horse race essentially? Who, so who can get out? In front? I'm not sure that I understand the question. When you say, when you start from zero, no, no one is starting from zero, right? I mean, like, I think that to, Fair maybe enough. Take another step back for a second. Um, I think your assumption hints at the fact that there is a limited supply of drivers. That's yeah. not the case. Actually, okay. more and more people are joining this economy. I think that's to some extent really, if you ask me why I am fairly optimistic overall in the future of the gig economy, it's exactly because of that, right? I mean, I think by now, um, there, are, there are more and more people in the US that their main income comes from these platforms. It's actually gone 10x over the last few years. There are around 95 million people already that make money in some way through the gig economy. Now, I know we tend to think about, and, and, and that's actually an important point, because when we say gig economy, we try to think immediately about the lower end of that. And the lower end is indeed Uber, Lyft, DoorDash. But then you go up a little bit and you see more and more retail locations, and that actually allow retail employees to switch between stores, mm -hmm. sometimes within the same mall, sometimes across malls. Then you go up a little bit and you get to firms like Fiverr and Upwork. Mm -hmm. Like if you want to try to do a quick Photoshop of, of a, a group of photos and eliminate a person, for example, you can go to Upwork and do that. If eliminate you want... me from this interview, just like. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, you know, just like you, you want the, the, the same person that was with you there and, and actually now blocking the view, you can actually remove them. Uh, you don't need to be an expert on on. on... <laughs> On, on Photoshop anymore. Uh, you want to script something. You want to transcribe something. You want to mock up for an app. Fiverr and Upwork are exactly for that. You want to go a level above that and you, you see firms like Catalan. Catalan was known initially as Arlie Nerd. These are essentially a MBA students or people that are former MBA students, former uh, consultants that are now tapping into the job market as freelancers on demand for S&P 500 firms. So I think the main point I'm saying that here is, is that two things. First of all, we should really not focus only on the bottom of the pyramid. Second, I think a lot of this market, what makes this market interesting is the success of firms like Uber and DoorDash and Deliveroo is actually creating liquidity of the marketplace that allows new firms to enter. I would agree with you in the following sense. If I'm competing with this, I'll try to make sure that I try to use that workforce not during peak time. Because during peak time, the one going to win is the one that has the more cash to burn into that. Because currently, they're very much burning cash during the peak time. There's no question. But if you manage to go off the peak time, like, you know, go puff, right? I mean, when you manage to go where the demand is actually away from that. In fact, even Via, the firm we worked with, most of the demand, the peak for them because most of the people that use them are commuters mm -hmm. is really not exactly the peak time. So if I'm a new entrant into the, the gig economy as a disruptor, as a, as a firm, a not as a, and I, I'll try to think about how can I tap into the existing driver. I was just seeing for DoorDash. DoorDash realized that because when DoorDash came, GrabHub was already a player. But GrabHub was already a player at the time only in two cities, essentially, Chicago and New York. And they realize that the suburbs have the following phenomena. There are many, many, many Uber drivers and they don't do anything, right? And, and so what they did, they said, we'll, we'll first of all contact the restaurants that actually need someone to deliver because currently there is no one else. And we'll go to the same drivers and say, at the time that you're sitting doing nothing, waiting for your Uber call, why don't you deliver food? And, and so I think that's of like what is interesting in the, in the gig economy. You can layer many, many other businesses on top of that without really fighting for the peak. The peak is going to be hard. Don't build the, build the business for the peak. If that's what you're building, you're going to compete with Uber and then they have more cash to burn than you. They, and they trained their investors not to care about losing money. Yeah, I have two follow-up questions here. I love this concept of liquidity um, because, and we should talk about whether that, you know, how that enables the macro shift here. 
But this concept of liquidity makes me want to question, is there a gig economy gateway drug, so to speak? So are there, what are the shifts? You just talked about some within the value chain, yep. if you will, of the gig economy. So you talked about Uber to DoorDash, right? When you're sitting, you can deliver food. Right. But do you see people that are getting in to try this thing out, let's say, or try Upwork, for example, and say, you know what, I have the skill on the side, I'll do it a little bit. And then, and then it was, you know, this was a great experience. Maybe I'll do a consulting project with Catalan or, you know, um, I, I enter with Uber and then I can say, okay, I can also deliver food. Maybe I should do it with some of my photography skills that I like to do as a hobby. Are people moving up and down this gig economy value chain? I think well, that's a great question. I think at this stage, I see primarily lateral moves. So I see someone at Fiverr, Upwork, 99 Designs. Uh, there are more and more things for musicians. You can actually, so I see more of lateral moves rather than upwards, but I'll tell you which firm is going to change that. LinkedIn just got into the gig economy creating a marketplace. LinkedIn knows about you and about us more than any other firm in terms of, in terms of our profession. They also own Linda. Right? I mean, the point here is that I, I think I was waiting for LinkedIn to get into this market for around 10 years because it's very clear that they know exactly your trajectory. They can predict how good you are going to be in five years from now and, and create a path for you to actually be there when needed. In my opinion, that is really what is needed now is someone to come and disrupt the, the professional education market and to say, if you had that need, we know in which market to slot you. I think at this stage, it's, a lot, it's about you. It's about you as an Uber driver to figure out mm -hmm. that you can do something else in your free time uh, rather than sitting idle in the airport waiting. Right? I, mean, I, I can definitely see an opportunity there. At this stage, it's really up to you to make this decision. This is fascinating. It's like AI-enabled... Uh, professional gig economy matchmaking, if you will, right? Yeah. That's so, and 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 I guess there's two ways of doing it, right? And I'm I'm kind of reacting to you real time. I get one way is based on courses you're taking with Linda, and the other is based on your experiences and exactly. maybe longevity in the job or or your, you know, exactly. I mean, you, you let's say I, I can see based on your Uber for performance that you're an amazing customer service. Why don't they put you in, in a customer success place for a SaaS firm? Right? I mean, you, you can see how once we get away from thinking about careers, it's something that you get to the university and then mm -hmm. get slot on, do an internship, move on. There are so many other opportunities to do that, but we're still locked into the old model that is training us to be a worker on an assembly line. We need to rethink that and say many times, actually, a customer success or a salesperson, there are many, many other ways to predict it rather than just looking at what you did before. I can actually see how you, how, like the, the customer, what feedback people have given you. If I have access to that, I can actually create an opportunity for you to make better decisions. Yeah, so the, you touched upon the point I was going to bring this up, feedback. So it almost makes sense, you know, like LinkedIn, I, I love that you brought this up because it's obviously the biggest professional network. You know, LinkedIn has endorsements of different skills um, and what you do. But in my experience, they're very seldomly used both endorsements, which is, go, yeah, go ahead. You but you know why? Me? You know why? Because they're so external to the work, right? The work is not done on LinkedIn. You do the work on, on, on what you did in your consulting project. Then you ask, can you give me an endorsement? And the other person is writing the most generic endorsement ever. Mm -hmm. See, imagine now that I look at what you did at Upwork and I can actually see the work and I can actually analyze it and I can see how quickly you responded. I don't need to tell me later on how quickly. I can see how quickly you responded. I can see how quickly, uh, how good the feedback was. I can see whether you chose me again, right? You can see the, right? I mean, think about platform. Platforms can monetize, have three flows to some extent. Platforms have a flow of the information, product and money, or service and money. You cannot monetize what doesn't go through you. Right? I mean, so LinkedIn is trying to monetize this endorsement, but then but the work was not done on, Netflix, on, on LinkedIn. The information didn't go on LinkedIn. The money didn't go on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is just an outside observer to work that was done in a different place. But LinkedIn is the best marketplace. So I think there's a, there's a complete hole for LinkedIn to build. Exactly. Or, or a startup to come and say, we're going to aggregate the data and then be a, a, essentially a crawler that can, if their terms of privacy and so on allow it, but there actually could be some sort of aggregator that gives back data back to Upwork and so on and so forth to bring it to all together so you can see what actually happens. I think that's what LinkedIn figured out, that it's actually no one wants to give you this information, um, primarily because Upwork needs this information to monetize. The moment it leaks outside of 
Upwork, they don't have any, any, any value anymore. The same for Fiverr, the same for Uber. I mean, there are, try, there are organizations that were trying to build an API on top of Uber to try to get information and help the driver make better decisions. Usually they're blocked. All the platforms understand exactly this point, that the moment you, tell, you let information leak, you're going to get disintermediated. That's what brought LinkedIn ultimately, and, and Microsoft as the owner of LinkedIn, of course, to understand that the only way to really hone on this information is by actually creating a marketplace where the transaction has to happen on LinkedIn. Yeah, that's, a, that's fascinating, especially if we think uh, about, you know, what's going to happen to organizations and how, how do you structure uh, an organization going forward, right? And, and can you structure an organization with a substantial part of your human capital being in this gig economy capital. And I see, you know, I, I love to, to get your point of view. And I guess for me, I see the positive is you can theoretically create a 24 seven work cycle, right? The negative is that a lot of times where I've seen the gig economies fail is um, for example, if you don't have a solid management structure or project management structure above it. So when you, when the baton gets passed from worker to worker to worker in development, computer development, uh, software development, for example, this happens all the time, the baton is passed and everyone is writing a little piece of code for like an enterprise level uh, platform, for example, it often becomes a bit of a Frankenstein. Now there's obviously open source platforms, but they're much more passion driven than work driven, right? So I think it's a little bit of a difference um, there. Do you, do you see this happening, this flipping happen? I think so. And, and, and I think the, the driver for that is a really, I think you said correctly, right? I mean, I think that the main issue, to, let me take again a step back for a second. And, and, and we have to remember that firms are a fairly recent phenomena. The, the first firm is 1602, right? Until then, firms did not exist. Freelancers existed since the dawn of civilization. So whenever we think that firms are always going to exist, we have to remind ourselves that firms are a fairly recent phenomenon. The Dutch Eastern company was the first one. Now you take that and you say, why do firms exist? I go back to your point, right? Why do firms exist? It's almost like asking yourself, why do I own a toothbrush? I use a toothbrush only 10 minutes a day. So why do I own it? I, I might as well rent it. And, and we own it because the complexity of managing Take, bring it to someone else, renting it back again. There are many, many questions about it. And the price difference is not high enough to be able to, to, make, it wor to make it worth. Same with employees. I, I would argue that most employees are useful a day a week. And I'm exaggerating. Less. Most employees are useful 10 minutes a week. But you don't want to... I, th I do think so. I mean, I think... If, I, if, how do you mean? Like the productivity? They, they, they do value-added work 10 minutes a week. And the rest are meetings or on Skype calls, on Zoom calls. Uh, I mean, uh, so uh, yes, I, I think they're doing things that are, are they're organizing so they will have these 10 minutes are going to be really, really great 10 minutes. But, but maybe a day a week. Okay, let, let's talk about a day a week. Day a week is 20% productivity, right? I, I, just to give you, I, I, I'm taking a very extreme approach, but you know, the same way that Toyota says that value added is only when you make a dent in the metal. Mm -hmm. Same for you, right? I'm an employee, only when you really make a difference, that's where you're productive. Other things you're preparing and doing things, but it's waste, waste of time. And so it's a waste of time for the, for the firm, but the firm is willing to pay five times your value or five times your, your, uh, yeah, your productive your, time, yeah. primarily because the rest of the contract is hard to make. So information leakage, I mean, the skill leakage, the fact that they don't really know how to contract, how to tell you what to do, and they prefer to educate you. And, and, and just give you the freedom to do other things. So you take that and you say, well, that's great. That's what we call transaction cost economics, right? Transaction cost economics means that the transaction is so complex, we prefer to own the means of production. But what many of these platforms do is, first of all, they make it much, much easier to specify the work. I mean, your, your point is important, right? If, if I can specify the work, it's going to be much easier to contract that out. I'll give an example. You see this microphone here. I uh, didn't have that before I started teaching online. And I realized that my, when, I, when I speak, there is a little bit of reverb, one of the students was pointing out. And I got this microphone and then realized that I need to get a whole preamp here. So I have a preamp and, and, and a fairly professional setting. But I realized I have no clue on how to set it up. Watched hours of YouTube, <laughs> didn't do it. Wharton 
doesn't have a sound engineer on staff. Surprising, but we don't have a sound engineer on staff. Uh, we have many IT people. And so I went to Upwork and said, I need a staff, a, a sound engineer that can help me set up this microphone. I wrote exactly the microphone, exactly the, the, the preamp that I have. And I need them for an hour for a Zoom call to be able to set it up. I had two, within, so it took me five minutes to write it. Within 15 minutes, I interviewed two people, both one in Portland, the other one, I don't know where he is. After an hour, one of them was with me on a call, set up everything. I even recorded that later on and let them set it up later on. They can send me feedback after that. Mm. Why am I describing that? It's a fairly amorphous activity. It's, it's the best, the simplest is I need to go from point A to point B. Uber took it. The second thing, I need to develop a mock-up for something. Then you get into set. Over time, you see more and more hedge funds, for example, outsourcing and gigifying their research. Why? I have a very specific task. I want to finish that. I need to create a design. Now, at the end, we're going to go, and you're right. I mean, I think ultimately, if you ask me how the firms of the future are going to look like, they're going to be gigified in the following sense. People tend to think that firms would like to hire specialists. I said the opposite. Firms are going to hire journalists. That their main skill is going to be the ability to manage all of these resources. Because if you need the best crypto for a specific activity, this person is not needed by any firm for more than five minutes a year. But there are enough people that need them for five minutes and in these five minutes, they're willing to overpay them. Your job is going to be able to find them, orchestrating them, and all the other specialists are going to be gig. It's, it's, it's a fascinating, so this is a fascinating thesis that in the future, um, the employees are going to shift to being product project or product managers. And you essentially, you're going to see a bifurcation of professional managers and skilled technicians, if you will, of whatever skill you have. And that's technicians artists. Are gonna, uh, artists. Yeah. Artists. No, no, it doesn't have to be technicians. The point I'm trying to say is that now you can be, the point here is that you will not or be- Highly skilled labor, let's say. Highly okay. skilled in a certain, right? Yes. Yeah. So it could be a driver, it could be an artist, it could be yep. a technician, it could be, so it's, you're, you're going to get this bifurcation between deep, an inch wide and a mile deep and a mile wide and an inch deep, mile wide, inch deep employee, inch, uh, mile, inch wide, mile deep, you're in the gig economy and you're, you're part of the supply curve, that's general supply curve. Um, yeah, that's fascinating because it also, it, it's, it's just like a lot, you know, like with, I, I, I focus a lot on COVID because I think COVID brought a, up a lot of tech changes that accelerated a lot of the changes that we were coming and just were kind of dragging their feet. <clears throat> the COVID created an impetus for us to change. And it, it this, uh, like a lot of other macro trends, I think the, the companies that are going to jump on this first are going to be able to reap rewards because there is a learning curve on how to actually restructure. Right. You know, I, an example comes to mind when I was at Microsoft, I was in the corporate strategy team. We looked a lot at um, actually what Adobe did and Adobe went from, you know, selling software to selling SaaS subscription services, mm -hmm. slightly different than gig economy, obviously, but they basically came to the street and said, Hey, look for two quarters or three quarters or whatever it was at that point. I think it was 2014 or 2015. They said, we're going to have hits, but once we restructure, when we come out, we're going to be a completely new model, right? And a completely new multiple which is gonna be much more valuable for our shareholders. And I see the same thing here because it doesn't, it, it's gonna take companies a little bit to figure out how to exactly to bifurcate and to utilize this 24 seven supply curve. I, I also think just based on this, just based on logic, if you can remove some of these, uh, some of the hard employee costs and just increase your efficiencies based on your thesis, the valuation of your company, the multiple of your company, it, it naturally will increase naturally will increase. It's an instant boost to, to the value of the firm. Right. I, I think if you ask me where COVID is coming, it's coming primarily, the key question to me at least is going to be to what extent firms are going to stay uh, as a work from home or flexible workforce. And, and the reason I'm saying that that is actually an important part is that it's so much easier to be a gig worker that think about moving up and down when you don't need to go to the office, when no one really knows what you're doing in the time zone you're in, right? Because you can imagine living in the, in the Bay Area 
and doing work in the, in the early morning for firms in New York and then starting your day and continuing the day by working with firms in Europe, right? Like, I, I think the, the more we're going to go back, the faster we're going to go back to the more rigid nine to five or, or, or you know, six, six, uh, six, nine, nine or six, 12, 12, whatever you, you call it in China, um, the more we're going to go back to a rigid workforce, I think the slower the gig economy is going to, to, to or this change are going to come. Some of this change, by the way, is also generational. Uh, I, I think you see people that grew up on mobile. Uh, for them, it's natural that most of the jobs come from mobile, that, that I manage my workforce by being on mobile. Their mm-hmm. classes were primarily online. So, so I think part of that, we can see that in, for, for Gen Zs, for example, much more willingness to, to be part of the gig economy. I mean, the notion of full-time employment is not a very appealing for many of them, in, in which case I think that COVID is accelerating by having people stay at home, but, but I'm not sure this is really the main impetus here. But I, but I fully agree with you. I mean, firms that will understand that. Uh, you see firms that I think are, I, I'm not saying that they're yet gigifying things, but they're definitely thinking about distributed workforce as, as a starting point, are firms that are going to do well here. So firms like Shopify, for example, are firms that come to mind as firms that I definitely think as someone will be leading the way in terms of overall thinking about how to, to restructure the firm. Firms like a Canva in Australia that you can see the way they manage the firm, that they understand that they, they, we, we need to rethink the way firms are structured. Uh, again, not gig yet, but I, I think these are the firms that where we're going to see a bit more innovative uh, thinking about these topics. And of course, Amazon, right? I mean, well, if I go to China, I'll say it's Alibaba, right? Alibaba is definitely, if you look at the entire supply chain, yeah. Tanyao in the middle as a fourth party logistic firm, uh, leading the way to what Amazon is now coping in the US, rethinking the, the fact that you don't need to own the supply chain. The only thing we need to do is actually create a platform for new businesses to do that. That, that is definitely the future of, of, a, of, of gig in that side, at least. It's almost, it sounds like to me, it's a parallel from going from brick and mortar to e-commerce, going from this nine to five to rethinking this fluidity. Let me play a little bit of devil's advocate, okay? The operational efficiencies here are clear, right? But there is a risk to brand and quality. How do you ensure now, and this is maybe the premium of hiring journalists that really understand how to run, uh, how to run these distributed teams, but how do you ensure that the brand image is there? Someone doesn't go out and says something insensitive or unbrand like or is on a video customer service call drinking a Pepsi when they're working for Coke, right? Um, and how do you ensure quality that the answer is 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 good and they're satisfying they, they, they are invested in the company's success and not just for this little blip so they will not but that's exactly the point but they will be invested in their own success and since we have so many data points right i mean the the, the belief was that and let me give you two different data points i think are going to be both interesting one is the assumption is that an uber driver you're never going to take the same driver again is not owned by anything why would he drive well and in fact uber drivers respond to feedback much more than Taxi drivers, why? Because we don't have the ability to give taxi drivers feedback. And so in most places, a taxi drivers behave, I mean, well, I'll, I can say definitely in Israel, taxi drivers are, are I mean, I'll, I'll be caught dead on a taxi because there's really no accountability, right? New York as well, right? I mean, you, you beg for them to take you to the New airport. New York is terrible. Right, and, but, but, but that's just, any, right? I mean, like Uber driver, you're in the car, they take you. Why? Because there is a very simple mechanism. There is no brand. But let me give you another example for that. When I spoke with the people from Catalan, I asked them, how did you address exactly this issue of quality? And they said that they actually, they were pretty surprised with the level of satisfaction that they had. And the reason for that is actually quite of interesting. The, the, the way that they worked was they were about to build an AI system where you can actually type whatever they want and the AI system will figure out what expert they need. Mm-hmm. Well, AI really wasn't very A and not very I. <laughs> it was maybe more A and less I. But anyway. It was a mechanical Turk in the bag, but nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but the reality is that the firms had to really write and then they start a conversation between the firm and the expert. And, and this conversation over text ensure that by the time actually the firm said, yes, we want that expert, actually it was so much friction that the project went through were actually fairly high quality, well above anyone, anything anyone expected. 
I mean, we tend to underestimate the interest of people in actually delivering good work if they have to do this work again, again, again. Your life is now needed based on that. It's not, I mean, you're absolutely going to be accountable. I mean, one of the main issues we have in corporate America is that there is zero accountability. But most people spend most of their time signaling rather than doing work. That's true. That's a, that's a, fascinating, that's a, that's a fascinating statement. That's right. Yeah. Right. And so gig economy is not solving everything, but solves that at least. Yeah, I, I love this premise of, of efficiency and, and being accountable. And um, if, there's a, if there's a solid way to review, this is just the only if. For some jobs, right. it feels like there's an easier way to review. Did you deliver? Yes or no. Was it on time? Yes or no. It's very, very binary. Or very, right. you know, were you a decent human being driving me and smiling? <laughs> yes or no, right? Um, you know, how did you write the strategy for me? A little more amorphous. Did the strategy right. succeed or fail? Who knows? Maybe it's a two-year strategy. You, you, don't, you, know, you never know. Maybe it didn't right. go well because of stakeholders, not because of your work. So, so, you know, but maybe it's okay to say the market will figure it out because the benefits and efficiencies right. going into it are, um, are great. And maybe it's the same thing if you're just getting an you know, employment review. You have one boss and maybe you get peer reviews, 360 reviews. I guess that's where they're going anyway. Right. To get to get that kind of score and you know, you should, you should do well. Yeah. That's um, I'm beginning to buy, buy into this vision now that you're, you're, I, and I love the this premise of liquidity of this pure liquidity because look, you know, I, I was trying not to go there, but I can't help it because a lot of times she and I talk about, you know, the future of finance and I always still talk about Bitcoin and crypto and in many ways it's, we're as a thematic society are heading into, more liquid, more flexible workforces, you know, finances, monetary policies, and so on and so forth, where, where the, the individual gets a lot more custody of um, and sovereignty over their work and over their wealth, right? This is, it's kind of like the society is now trending that way. Um, yeah. Right. I mean, I just I'll add another concept on that, that, that David Perel is talking about. That's the concept of personal monopolies. Mm-hmm. But the way he thinks about it, and actually I think will be very much resonating with what you're saying. Think about, like, think about the past. The past, you had, the, if you were a writer for the New York Times, you had an amazing distribution channel, and you had to, you had to write for the average New York Times reader. But you didn't have to do anything beyond that because you had a channel. You had a distribution. The internet flipped that. You don't have a channel anymore. Everybody, everybody can do whatever they want. Distribution actually cost is going to, to zero. It's actually your responsibility to broadcast at the signal you choose. And if you continuously broadcast at the signal you choose and the signal is of high quality, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. people will find you. It's not your job to find them. The New York Times was finding them for you and that's why you became lazy in trying to broadcast for the, for the average. No, now you need to rethink that. You have to think about how do you actually, exactly your point, gain your, uh, the, the control over your signal, build your monopoly around it. The monopoly can be small because there are enough people in the world that if you generate good quality signal, good quality content, you're good, or, or whatever you're doing is good work, you have a monopoly on that thing. It's, it's not easy to replicate. Very much the way we think about firms. It's not easy to replicate. The skills mm. are complementary. You have something different to say, different point of view. You don't have to be right all the time, but you, you are generating interesting content. If you think about one of my former students from Kellogg, Ben Thompson, has strategy. I mean, you can see that's exactly what he does, right? I mean, he, it's a one-man operation mm. generating really good content. Half the time, I disagree with him, but they always have something interesting to say. Mm-hmm. It allows me to have sort of like a person to debate with. I think that this is to some extent the way we need to think about educating the next generation. So they, when they go out, whatever they do, they think about how do I become that person monopoly? It's very on motif. There's a book written actually uh, kind of before their time and in about 99, I believe it's called The Sovereign Individual. Yeah. And it touches, right? It touches I, exactly on a lot of these, these, um, these themes. They, maybe they, they were probably a little bit early for, for a full sovereign individual, but now it feels really like the time is, you know, 20s to the 2030s, I think will be the time where you're going to have this autonomous, fluid society with self-driving vehicles and self-driving taxis and, you know, fluidity, again, a custody of money, uh, custody uh, and be able to work. And I think it's going to be an interesting time as always technology is very exponential uh, about how we rethink the economy, how we rethink the firm 
And then how do you balance it, right? How, yeah. I think there's going to be a lot of emphasis on how do you actually make this whole thing run. Yeah, so let me talk about the two maybe things that, that you, we should be concerned about when we think about that. One... No, no, let's just end now on a high note and then we're... <laughs> <laughs> because I think I, I, I'm very bullish, but at the same time, I, 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 what are the two things that are biggest risk? One is if every minute of your time can be monetized, where is the point where you actually decide to do things that are not to monetize, right? I mean, like you, some, someone is coming and asking you to, to cross the, the road. Are you asking them to pay as well or are you just helping them cross the road? Someone is asking you to open the door, are you more, right? Like, I mean, th there is a limit yeah. from that where we need to be afraid. Second one, and that's not what I go back to our study with VIA. To me, at least, when we look at the term inertia, Inertia sounds very, very positive, but I can also spin it in a very negative way, right? I mean, think about like addiction is a type of inertia. Mm. And so if you decide, if you watched five movies on Netflix and you want to watch the sixth one, I mean, that's fine. I mean, you're not really posing a, any danger to the rest of the world. But if you have been eight hours on the road and you decide yeah. to do the ninth, okay, there are externalities to that. There are externalities, first of all, to the other drivers, to your passengers, to your mental health, to your family. So I think... I am not a, a big fan of regulation, but I think regulation needs to understand where there are market inefficiencies or where the market actually, market works well when people are rational. Inertia is not a rational behavior, in which case regulator, and you sit in New York, I think New York actually does the right thing, which is collecting from all the different players the time that every driver works and try to cap that, making sure that, we, that they try to regulate of all the usage of time Primarily because when you're on the road, you are posing a risk to others. I mean, there is no question about that. Well, you know what that's going to do? Well, you know, sorry, this is, this is so interesting because I, I, because you're right. Like I'm thinking like, let's take drivers, Uber and Lyft. You need to know how much you've driven Uber so that you combine it with Lyft. But if you're saying, okay, we're going to cap it at eight hours a day, there's going to be self-selection. It's a game theory process of when all of the drivers are going to go out or not go out. Right. And it's going to become a complete gamification of the system, right? right? Of one, you're going to hit peaks which areas are going to work and you're going to have massive local inefficiencies of a lack of drivers. Right. <laughs> right. 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 Exactly. So what you see is in Chicago, they bring drivers from the suburbs during a peak time. Initially, they did not allow drivers from the suburbs to get into the city. You had to have a city specific license. Mm -hmm. Now it's the opposite. They need to bring them actually from, from Naperville. So they have enough drivers for peak time. So I, I think you're making an excellent point. I mean, overall, this problem is extremely complex on almost every aspect that you see in that, and which is what I find fascinating in it. Yeah. So uh, I know we're kind of coming up on time, but I want to ask you a couple of things. Which, uh, which, so what's next? You know, which industry is going to be gigafied next? What do you think is ripe for disruption? Um, I, I do think that the skills in the middle that are, so for example, I, I do think, I mean, you see already designers being, gig, being sort of like a gig. I, I think if, if you think about most things that are, a, that are jobs that are, are easy to specify what I need for you and, and I really don't need you for the majority of the time. So, you know, places where, let, let's say actually what we're not going to be gigified, it might, might be easier to do it like that. Places where you need relationship, right? So I, I'm not sure, like you see already there are gigafied places. Gigafied dating, gigafied dating. Like someone eats dessert, someone eats the appetizer, somebody eats <laughs> right. the Yes, so, so like, no, but, but if I go back, right, con consultant, sometimes you, they're within a consulting team, you can mm -hmm. actually see it there, right? The consulting team, the, the partner, the engagement manager, you want someone that gives continuity. Some of the, you don't need to teach the entire language again, again, again. The analysts, why do I need them to be part of the firm? They're anyway plug and play. So why do I need to pretend that they're part of the firm? Software developers. I know that firms are currently a, assume that every developer needs to be full-time. But, but, but why? This is driven a little bit by the fact that you're going back to your point that it's a little bit like, like a... a, a a, a mix and match of different things, but that's a little bit driven by the fact that the languages are written in a, in a very, in, in a way that assumes that the same person is going to do everything from the beginning to the end. That's just an assumption that's definitely going to change. And, and so I think you'll need people at the management level 
but I cannot think almost on anything that, that, that cannot be geekified almost. The only places is, again, if you need continuity, so management need continuity, relationship need, need continuity. A um, physician, right? And we know that physician, for example, it's definitely already half gigified, right? I mean, I think you don't always see Tell the same medicine. person. Yeah. But you, we do know that if you see the same person, your treatment is better. So we do know that outcomes are better, at least if you're a primary care physician, is the same person that can ask you again, 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 the same questions. I think there is some value in that. But it's a trade-off, right? I mean, clearly sometimes people ask you, do you want to see your own physician or are you okay with seeing someone else? And many times they say, well, I don't care where I see. But that person might as well just came from, uh, from Uber. But it's actually, it's partly, it's partly gigafied. Your PCP, your primary care physician, it right. might be the one, but then specialists are like, go see them or go see them or go see them. And that's more one-off as long as your PCP is good enough to, or, or very exactly. good in the focus about collecting all the information, distilling it to you. That's the manager. Literally, actually, that's a very good uh, analogy in, in the world that's been gigafied in a way that we haven't even thought about. Right, right? exactly. Because specialists are gigafied. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The moment we understand that the word gigify doesn't have to mean Uber and Lyft, we understand that most of our jobs already have a significant aspect of that. The physicians one is interesting, especially the way the hospitals and networks work. And then we've yeah. been moving away from private um, uh, care offices. So the like little offices into a big network where you have a PCP and then the rest of the people are just a part of that. I, I think there's still work to be done in terms of solving actual long-term health, you know, uh, care, and it's still a little right. jaggedy, but it, it's, it's an interesting model that's been going there for years, actually, probably 10 years or so that, yeah, no one, like I said, thinks about as a gig economy. Right. If you see the way they build, it's very much like that. Yeah. So uh, maybe let one more question uh, before, before we wrap. You know, is there anything, is there, do you see any, any other risks or anything that we're missing? I know you talked about two risks about, you know, uh, where does regulation kind of step in and, you know, what's too much? Um, and, you know, how do you have this continuity of this solid manager? But any, anything that, that screams to you that, that, or maybe like a canary in the coal mine that would say, you know, we've gone too far or maybe this is not working. So I think, so I'd say two things. I think, first of all, you can see what happened in California, AB5 and then Proposition 22, right? First of all said, yeah, oh, you yeah. should drive all of them as employees. And then employees themselves said, I don't want to be a qualified employee. I spoke with a journalist. He was actually living somewhere in the woods. So, Professor, can you explain a little bit the, the yes. so, so, right. So, so California, first of all, asked, instituted a law that basically required all of these employees to be, spec all of the gig workers, many of them were like journalists, employees. has to be specified employees, paid mm -hmm. benefits, vacation, social security, and everything. And then they realized that actually the impact of that is going to be much more beneficial, by the way, to the big firms, um, what we call regulatory capture. But in fact, the employees themselves don't really like that idea. Many of them chose to live in places that allowed them to be gig workers rather than live in LA. Journalists, for example, had to live and, be, and belong to a, a, to an editorial board to be able to publish in a, in a newspaper. And so they came another... A, a, proposition and, and then people nullify that. So actually you, you don't need to be specified as a, a, as a worker. I think here, the CEO of Uber, a Dara Kordeshai, I hope I, I pronounced the last name correctly. A, he actually, I think is one of those that understand that the gig economy firms will have to do something. What I mean by that, they will, we will need to find a new type of employees a new type of category that will basically say, you're not a worker, but we do understand we bear some of the responsibility for the thing we're doing. If you work for us above a certain number of hours, mm -hmm. right? So we need to create a fund where we a, a, allocate funds to your a paid leave and towards your vacation day, towards your COBRA, towards, right? These are not independent contractors in the same way we think about the plumber. Right? I mean, it's not the same way and, and we need to create. And so he is very much in favor of that because my fear is that we're going to go with a little bit too much regulation, like what you see now in London, where they actually ask them to be employees. But in fact, interestingly, they ask them to be paid only when the time they work. They actually don't need to give them a minimum wage in the time they don't work, which is stuff like a, a mixture of solutions. But if you, so if you ask me what's the big risk, the big risk is that we're going to overreact and stop this entire thing. And, and the people are going to suffer from that, in my opinion, are us as consumers and 
workers, their workers. And, the, and the people are going to benefit from that are actually those who are managing the big firms. Because if I go back into one, if you, there is one takeaway that, that I do want the listener to take is this point about liquidity. Because to me, at least, we are just seeing the beginning of the gig economy. Our, in my opinion, we are all, will be better off if we see more firms coming and offering gig economy solutions or solutions to gig economy workers. Firms like Catch, which are offering a solution for, firm, for gig economy workers that want to invest in their future, that want to have a 401k, right? I mean, I think the government doesn't, offer, doesn't have to offer everything. We are going to see many, many solutions are, in my opinion, one of the main benefits of having more and more firms joining that we're going to have sort of like this kind of a flywheel where more firms are going to join, we're going to see more solutions, more workers are going to join. And ultimately, the workers and us as consumers are going to be better off and there will be firms that are, are supporting that. I, I, I'm afraid that we, things are moving a little bit too fast for some people and we'll see some people trying to disrupt it in a way that we're going to go back to where we were 20 years ago. I agree. And this is a whole other topic. Maybe we can discuss the whole time another time about, you know, regulation. And Shimon and I talk about this a lot. A lot of the solutions that are put forward, not that regulation is all bad, but a lot of the solutions that are put forward aimed to alleviate costs, aimed to, you know, help those in need actually come back and hurt the ones that are aiming to help. Um, and 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 that's very just that's just unfortunate it's just unfortunate i think in the lack of foresight about the second and third order effects right. of of the regulation so uh professor thank you so much for coming uh this is a fascinating talk where can our listeners find you um or not or i i know there's there are books and papers that you're writing uh just tell us tell us a little bit more about the research that you're doing yeah, so they can enroll in my newsletter. I have a newsletter once a week. I send exactly summaries on this topic, the gig economy, get along on, on Substack or otherwise on, on Twitter, G underscore alone on Twitter. Um, I, I try to keep my former students informed and, and make sure they understand how things are moving and, and, and using that, happy to talk about almost every topic related to the gig economy. So if you are firm listening to that and you have an interesting data set, happy to try to collaborate and making sure that we shed light on interesting phenomena. Fantastic. Thank you. We'll, we'll link all of this uh, in the show notes. G underscore alone. I uh, got alone in Substack. Thank you so much. Uh, our listeners, thanks for tuning in. Please send us feedback. Um, love listening to the feedback on LinkedIn. Like, subscribe, the rest, not financial advice. Um, the things we have to say at the end of all the podcast. Uh, Professor, a uh, huge pleasure and a treat for having you on. Thank you so much for coming. Alex, great to be here. Great to be here again. <laughs>